Hello, my name is Roger Tatum. I'm from the University of Washington, and I'm going to give you a talk on interpretation essentials for the manometry report. I have no disclosures to report. What I'm going to be talking about today will first be to introduce you to the Chicago classification version 3.0, which is the standard for manometry interpretation around the world right now. Um, the key components of how we do this manometry interpretation, that is the key metrics that we put all together and develop an algorithm for uh, coming up with a final diagnosis, then ultimately what elements to include in, in the final report. So uh, as a review, this is what a normal swallow sequence looks like on high resolution esophageal manometry. You have the upper esophageal sphincter band of higher pressure here at the top. Here's a swallow with that drop in pressure where that color turns to blue, and then the uh, high upstroke after contraction of the upper esophageal sphincter. Below this is the esophageal body. Here during the swallow, there's a nice progressive uh, high amplitude band of pressure uh, representing the peristaltic sequence. And then toward the bottom of the tracing is the lower esophageal sphincter band of pressure here. You see it's interrupted, the, uh, the swallow is reduced, uh, has resulted in a relaxation, and then the after contraction uh, here, and then it comes back down to the baseline lower esophageal sphincter pressure. Below that, of course, is intragastric pressure. So on our x-axis of this diagram, we have length along the esophagus. Pressure is represented by uh, a differential color, as indicated on this scale here on the left. Um, uh, and the y-axis is time in seconds. So the Chicago classification was first proposed and uh, put into place in 2008, and the most recent revision on this was updated in 2015. The fourth version of this uh, is actually in development right now, will be published relatively soon. This incorporates data from multiple channels at once in the high-resolution uh, manometry paradigm in order to provide a detailed and really more accurate representation of what's going on with individual swallows and uh, motility events that happen during the swallow sequences. There are three primary metrics that are used to uh, develop ultimately the diagnosis that we make as a result of uh, uh, what we're doing with the Chicago classification. And those are the integrated relaxation pressure, or IRP, distal contractile integral, or DCI, and the distal latency. I'm gonna start by talking about the integrated relaxation pressure. This is a measure of swallow-induced lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. Uh, and it's, it's not simply a um, nadir pressure or single point pressure, but it's actually looking at this band of um, pressure all across the LES during the entire duration of what's called the deglutitive relaxation window or the swallow uh, itself. From the time that the uh, swallow begins, as indicated here, the relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter until the time that the uh, peristaltic wave reaches the lower esophageal sphincter. So what we do is we take four seconds during that time, and that's the time that it is thought that the bolus has the best opportunity to pass through the lower esophageal sphincter, and we are looking at the lowest pressure at any, uh, uh, at any four seconds in that window there. So that's why we call it the integrated relaxation pressure. And a normal integrated relaxation pressure is less than 15 millimeters mercury for um, one of the more commonly used manometric systems, the Medtronic system, uh, as it's currently known, uh, or less than 21 millimeters mercury in the Sand Hill system. And really, with, for the purposes of the manometry report, we're looking at the median uh, integrated relaxation pressure for all of uh, all 10 of the swallows that are performed during the study. So we see an abnormal IRP in two pathologic entities. The first of these, of course, is achalasia, in which you have abnormal LES relaxation is really a major part of the definition. So the IRP is greater than the upper limit of normal. And furthermore, there's an absence of any normal peristaltic contractions. And that's very important. There is an absence of any normal peristaltic contractions. Right here, we have type 1 achalasia, where there's no peristalsis whatsoever, no pressurization within the esophagus, and no relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. Then there's type 2 achalasia, which is represented by these 
panesophageal pressurizations, these columns of pressure that stretch from the inferior border of the upper esophageal sphincter to the uh, border of the, the proximal border of the LES. Uh, and type, finally, type 3 achalasia, in which you have uh, these spastic contractions. These are premature contractions. They are, they are spasm. They are not normal peristaltic sequences. And they're typically high amplitude like this. The other entity we see is something called esophagogastric junction outflow obstruction, which is a mouthful, EJ, EGJ00, in which the IRP is greater than the upper limit of normal, but there is at least some normal peristalsis. Now, often you can see an effective peristalsis, but there will be some normal peristalsis and there will be progressive peristaltic sequences, unlike in achalasia. The next uh, major metric is the DCI or distal contractile integral. This is really a measure of the overall strength and force of the uh, esophageal peristaltic contraction or the vigor. This takes into account the length of the segment uh, uh, of contraction that we're looking at, which is really the essentially the distal two thirds of the esophageal body. The amplitude of that contraction over the time it takes for that uh, to um, to occur and the time that it takes in itself uh, to progress. So it's measured as, as um, uh, overall millimeters mercury per centimeters per second. Uh, so we can then characterize each individual swallow sequence based on the DCI, as well as one other component of this, which is known as the peristaltic break. And that is the space between the proximal esophageal segment and the distal two thirds or distal esophageal segments here. So uh, that peristaltic break is measured in centimeters. So in looking at individual swallows using the DCI, a failed swallow is one where the distal contractile integral is less than 100 millimeters mercury per centimeter per second. Whereas a weak swallow is greater than 100 millimeters mercury uh, uh, per centimeter per second, but less than 450. And a normal swallow is in the window between 450 and all the way up to 8,000. So any of those would be considered normal as long as they're not premature or something like that, which we'll get into in some of the next slides. And greater than 8,000 millimeters mercury per centimeter per second is known as a hypercontractile. Looking at normal swallow sequences, a fragmented one would be one in which the peristaltic break, again, that distance in centimeters between the proximal and distal segment is greater than or equal to five centimeters. So the major disorders of peristalsis that we see with this include hypertensive peristalsis, which is most commonly referred to now as jackhammer esophagus. And this is one in which at least 20% of swallow sequences have a DCI of greater than 8,000. Uh, you'll note that we no longer in Chicago classification version 3.0 uh, have the entity nutcracker esophagus. That, that term has fallen by the wayside in favor of this higher amplitude jackhammer esophagus. And then there's absent peristalsis or absent contractility. And that's where all of the swallows are failed. That is, there is no uh, no normal swallow, uh, no swallow with a DCI of greater than 100 in the entire swallow sequence. Uh, then the minor disorders of peristalsis include ineffective esophageal motility in which at least 50% of peristaltic sequences are, are weak or failed. So they can be either. Again, if they're all failed, then we consider that absent contractility, which is a more significant entity. But ineffective motility just means that at least 50% of them are weak or failed. And then fragmented peristalsis. And that is, of the uh, peristaltic sequences that are of a normal DCI, at least 50% of those are associated with a uh, peristaltic break of greater than or equal to five centimeters. The third major component is the distal latency, or DL. This is the time um, between the onset of the swallow as measured at the uh, relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter to what's known as the contractile deceleration point. And that is where the uh, progress of the peristaltic wave goes from a rapid to a slower progression. Here. And that usually occurs about three centimeters above the LES. And in fact, the distal latency must be measured uh, 
within three centimeters of the LES, not above that. Uh, and so that time is normally at least four and a half seconds. So a distal latency of less than 4.5 seconds represents what we call a premature contraction, what we more used to commonly refer to as a spasm. So this is a good example of a premature contraction here, uh, uh, one in which the distal latency is only three seconds. This looks like a simultaneous contraction, and indeed it is. But it is not to be confused with one like this, where you have a very large peristaltic break, and really that's the primary problem here. But the distal latency is actually 5.9 seconds, so that's normal. So this is actually, uh, instead, this is a fragmented peristaltic segment, not a premature contraction, not a simultaneous contraction. So that changed the definition of distal esophageal spasm a little bit, in which distal esophageal spasm, what used to be known more commonly as diffuse esophageal spasm, is now defined by a uh, patient that has a distal latency of less than four and a half seconds and at least 20% of their, um, uh, of their swallows during the study. So those are all the basic tools. And when we put all of this together, we can come to a hierarchical approach in evaluating uh, the, our final diagnosis, which is really the most important part of this whole thing. So we start looking at the IRP. We start with esophagogastric junction outflow. And before I describe this, I must give credit to uh, Dr. Prakash Kailali at the at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, who, uh, who developed this particular hierarchical approach algorithm that I'm showing you here. So EGJ outflow, um, uh, again, is measured by the integrated relaxation pressure. And an obstruction of EGJ outflow is, therefore, an IRP, median IRP, that is, greater than the upper limit or normal. Again, for the Medtronic system, that's 15 millimeters mercury. For the commonly used Sandhill system, that's 21 millimeters mercury. So that includes type one, type two, and type three achalasia in any patient that has EGG outflow obstruction without any normal peristalsis. And then if you have some intact peristalsis, but you still have an elevated IRP, that is EGJ outflow obstruction. This is um, a, a different diagnosis uh, and, and may be associated with other factors. We see that a lot of times actually in patients with um, uh, paraesophageal hiatus hernia. They have at least some and perhaps all normal peristalsis, but they have EGJ outflow obstruction that is probably clinically insignificant. And in fact, the number of clinically significant EGJ outflow obstruction cases is is reasonably small since many of them can be explained by other things. Um, a particular caveat is that achalasia must be considered in some patients who have an IRP below the upper limit or normal, but there is absolutely no normal peristalsis. And therefore, we use other factors to help us determine whether or not that's achalasia versus simply uh, absent contractility, as you might see in somebody with scleroderma esophagus, for example. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, EGJ outflow obstruction um, can be caused by a variety of other things, including mechanical obstructions from a tumor or something like that, or you know, uh, uh, that might also show you something like pseudoachalasia in other cases. Uh, so further investigation is needed for uh, patients with EGJ outflow obstruction in almost all cases. And I typically will recommend in, in the text of my report that a patient with EGJ outflow obstruction uh, have their symptoms and manometric findings correlated with upper endoscopy or an upper GI barium swallow study. Uh, and again, remember that the upper limit or normal uh, is dependent upon which manometric system that you're using. So moving on from esophagogastric junction outflow, now we assess the peristaltic body. Uh, first, we look for the major disorders of peristalsis, and I've already mentioned those are hypercontractile disorder, jackhammer esophagus, distal esophageal spasm, uh, which is defined by the distal latency, and absent contractility, or complete absence of, peris of peristalsis, all swallows with a DCI of less than 100 millimeters mercury. Then we have the minor disorder of peristalsis. Those include ineffective esophageal motility uh, and fragmented peristalsis. And finally, we have 
essentially normal manometry if it doesn't fit into any one of those other categories. So that's it. This is what the algorithm looks like putting it all together. Um, I'm not going to go through these individually because I just did that. Um, but you can see first looking at EGJ outflow obstruction, ruling out achalasia. If not that, it's EGJ, EGJ outflow obstruction by itself. Now we're looking at peristalsis with a normal IRP. And we look at the distal latency and we look at the distal contractile integral. The major disorders of peristalsis, DES, jackhammer esophagus, absent contractility. If it's not one of those, is it one of the minor disorders of peristalsis? Note that there's a red dotted line here indicating that really those are the major motility disorders that we've just covered and we've ruled those out. Now we go to the minor disorders of peristalsis. IRP is normal, we have, um, but we have greater than 50% of ineffective swallows, that's ineffective esophageal motility or fragmented peristalsis if that's defined by the fact that the um, peristaltic break is greater than five centimeters uh, and not otherwise ineffective. Then finally, ruling all of that out, you have normal manometry. So what goes into the final report? Well, this varies by the center, but what I like to include is LES analysis, especially the LES resting pressure and the IRP. Oftentimes people will include the, uh, the uh, proximal border of the LES, uh, which gives an estimate of the overall esophageal length, as well as whether or not you see a dual high pressure zone, which is associated with hiatal hernia. Not really in the scope of what I'm, uh, what I'm covering here, but another thing you can put in the report. And then an analysis of peristalsis, the mean DCI, mean distal latency, then those percentages of contractions which are normal, percent failed, percent weak, percent hypercontractile, and percent premature. And then, though it's not part of the Chicago classification, the upper esophageal parameters, such as the UESP and uh, measures of UES relaxation. Again, I didn't go over the analysis of that here because it's really not part of the Chicago classification, but uh, it really kind of depends on, on what you're trying to do with your studies and, and, and who's really interested in these. You'll find that the otolaryngologists typically are somewhat interested in those parameters more than, uh, than uh, uh, foregut surgeons will be. Then the last part is the final diagnosis. This is our unifying diagnosis based on the algorithm that I've just presented. This I think is the most important and I think also bears telling that for the average surgeon and e even most gastroenterologists, it's this last which is the most important and probably the only thing that they're really going to read and pay attention to. It's only those who are somewhat more in depth in their knowledge that are going to read beyond that and look at your parameters which you've listed that support your diagnosis. So that's basically everything in a nutshell. It's a lot of material. Um, uh, thank you again for taking the time to listen to this today. And if you have any questions or would like to discuss anything with me directly, I'd be very happy to answer them. You can email me at rtatum at uw.edu. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care.